Hello Chipmunk and Chipette fans, my name is Grandy Tamayas, and welcome to another Alvin and the Chipmunks elaboration video. Today's topic being, what exactly are the Suck Toads from the 2015 series Season 2 episode, Suck Toad? Now, I know what some of you may already be thinking. What does any of this have to do with the Chipmunks, the Chipettes, or the series as a whole? Answer, probably not much, if anything. Back in 2016, when the Suck Toad episode first aired, the fanbase reaction was overwhelmingly positive, and I too thought of the episode in high regard, though not for the same reason as most of those fans. While all the Alvitany shippers were squealing in happiness, I was geeking out trying to understand what the title animal actually is. Obviously I know the Suck Toad was simply made up, but with my knowledge on speculative zoology, as well as the strangest of real-life amphibians, I think I can explain the physical traits and morphology of them as if they were real organisms. I've already done a similar thing with my Grandi Tamias Bagdasarii fictional rodent for the evolution of talking chipmunks, so if something like those could exist in the Alvinverse, so too could a suck toad. Let's start with what we know about the suck toad's habitat, diet, and how they behave. Like all amphibians, the suck toad needs moisture to survive, and primarily gets it through the mud that it lives in. From the description we're given later by the specialist, the toads don't like bright lights and vibrant colors. When Brittany uses a tablet computer, the toad responds negatively to the bright blue wavelengths of light that come from the surface of the screen. Speaking of which, if you're watching this right now on a phone or other device at night, do your eyes a favor and turn on the night shift setting or whatever it's called. The specialist also mentions leaves, dirt, and decay when addressing the attire that Brittany should wear to make the suck toad feel more comfortable. From all these descriptions, the most likely habitat for a suck toad would probably be some kind of rainforest or jungle, maybe one with very little light reaching the forest floor, such as the Amazon or Southeast Asia. But it's hard to pin down for certain where in the world suck toads would actually be from. They are said to be endangered, so their habitat range is probably restricted to a very small area, like how a lot of endangered amphibians are today. In fact, knowing from being a volunteer educator at my local zoo, which is involved with a lot of amphibian conservation efforts, one of the main problems is that many amphibians are only native to one or two areas of wetland, and thus harm to that area could likely mean the extinction of an entire species. According to the amphibian specialist, the suck toad likes to eat vegetation and recommends feeding it kale. It can also eat worms and presumably other small invertebrates as well. However, most amphibians in real life can only eat bug larvae, algae, and small freshwater plants as tadpoles, but not as adults. In fact, the suck toads lack the wide mouths that other frogs and toads have. If anything, they're more similar to that of a tadpole's mouth. It's possible that this was a neotetic trait, the retention of juvenile features into adulthood, similar to how the axolotl salamander never becomes a true salamander adult and retains its external gills throughout its life. This would allow the suck toad to take on a new niche so that it wouldn't have to compete with other frogs and toads from the same area that use the traditional feeding strategy. And it would explain the suck toad's ability as an adult to eat kale and green roughage like the specialist described. That being said, we also don't know much about the suck toad's lifestyle compared to other amphibians, as we've only seen what we can assume to be the adult version. As for their six legs, that's a little tougher to figure out. For one thing, there are no terrestrial vertebrates with more than four limbs. And while there are cases of frogs that grow additional limbs, this is mainly due to a parasitic flatworm named Riberoia ondatre, I think I'm pronouncing that right. It doesn't cause them to sprout three pairs of perfectly functional limbs symmetrically on both sides of their bodies. Not to mention that the suck toads have three toes on each of them, whereas real toads have four on each front leg and five on each back leg. However, it could be possible that these supposed legs aren't actually legs at all. They could just be outgrowths of skin used to give a convincing camouflage. To a predator, those brown outgrowths could just look like a couple of twigs, which, coupled with the color and texture of the toad's back, could make it look like a natural part of the surface that it lives on, and why Alvin was at first fooled into thinking that these suck toads were just blobs of mud. 
Wabegong sharks use similar outgrowths on their bodies to look like plant debris on the seafloor, although they use it primarily for ambush hunting rather than predator avoidance. And nature has actually done odder things with the outgrowths on the sides of amphibians before, like with the hairy frog from Central Africa. And from the looks of the flabby edges around the suck toad's body, it is possible that the real legs are just hidden underneath it. Asian giant salamanders also have some flabby edges of loose skin on their bodies, which they can use for texture camouflage and some oxygen extraction from water. Finally, we come to the biggest question that I have about the suck toad. How does it interact with its host? It's uncertain how long the suck toad could have stayed attached to Brittany or the manner in which it would have been able to leave if the specialist didn't intervene. Note that I use the word host, as in a symbiotic relationship, since the suck toad is affected by Brittany's own biology. As stated very clearly, Brittany was not allowed to eat sugar because the toad absorbs it, but that shouldn't be possible if the toad was just resting on the surface of Brittany's skin around her eye. It is true that amphibian skin is sensitive to chemicals they come into contact with in the water if it becomes polluted, making them what scientists call an indicator species to judge the health of an ecosystem. But mammals don't just excrete excess sugar through the skin. Instead, we produce insulin, except those who are affected by diabetes, to control our blood sugar level. And it's that blood part I want to focus on. What if, and this is just an idea, the suck toad absorbs nutrients by tapping into the bloodstream of its host like a vampire. I know it sounds crazy, but hear me out, please. This would explain the toad's need for the host to remain in a calm environment, since stress raises blood pressure, as Dave surely knows, and the suck toad could be harmed by that if it's very sensitive to changes in the blood that it's tapping into. Perhaps it only does this for supplemental nutrients that it can't get from its usual diet, to get additional vitamins, proteins, perhaps even iron. Come to think of it, this would explain why the specialist suggested feeding the toad kale, which is a superfood containing a lot of, you guessed it, iron. As the plant isn't native to tropical forests, it would make sense that captive suck toads could be fed kale and other iron-rich plants to supplement their natural diet that they would otherwise have to resort to parasitic behavior to get. As for it having a taste in blood in the first place, it's really not all that unbelievable. Tadpoles of some species do cannibalize each other. Yeah, they got the necessary hardware in their mouths to break through living tissue, so a blood-sucking behavior? Very much possible. But don't be afraid. Perhaps the blood-sucking ability can be put to good use for the humans of the Alphanverse. And real life, too. Both amphibians and a lot of different animals that suck blood are being studied for biomedical purposes to create new treatments for human diseases. Vampire bat saliva has been used to help stroke victims, and many endangered frogs can produce specific chemicals in their bodies that can be used to treat just about every disease under the sun, like cancer and Alzheimer's. So when the specialist says that the suck toad can do remarkable things for the human race, that is 100% scientifically accurate. But unfortunately, many of those amphibian species are starting to become extinct before we can learn their medical secrets. So what I hope you all take away from watching this is that these creatures have so much more value than we know and need to be protected. Simple things you can do to help include just keeping your local waterways clean from trash and dispose of hazardous chemicals like car fluids, fertilizers, and battery acid properly so that they don't end up as runoff. Sorry if I seem preachy with this environmental message, but look at it this way. Jeanette would care. Would you? And that's pretty much all the basic stuff there is to know about the suck toad from what little information the show gave us. Now, with the assistance of Google Translate, I shall come up with a hypothetical genus and species name for this amazing speculative amphibian. I hereby name it to be Platybufo Hirudo or the flat toad that sucks blood. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this scientific analysis of the suck toad. Feel free to let me know in the comments what you think. Did you learn something new about amphibians? And do you think the suck toad can actually suck blood? Don't forget that you're also welcome to leave a like and or subscribe if you think this video was worth your time in watching. Speaking of subscribers, I recently passed 100, so to them, 
thank you all for your support. I guess this can be considered a 100 subscriber milestone. Who knows what subject I'll have planned for the next milestone, but I hope it'll be just as spectacular. With all that said, thanks again, and have a nice day.